August 15, 1989, Peekskill, New Jersey. On the business tonight, Nancy will have some literature afterward concerning our inner circle friends and uh, that sort of thing, and it'll be available in the rear of the auditorium at some point. But I want to get down to business tonight and do God's business, and if you'll turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> Let's bow together in prayer. Lord of life, we're delighted to be back here with our dear brothers and sisters in Peekskill. And we ask that you'll pour out your spirit on each one of our hearts with enlightenment and understanding. May we receive the spirit of wisdom, every one of us, and revelation in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. May the eyes of our heart be enlightened, so that we'll know the hope of our calling, the glorious riches of the inheritance that you have in us, and may we also know the exceeding greatness of your power in us, according to the working of your mighty power which you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and set him at your own right hand in heavenly places far above all principalities and powers, might and dominion, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and that you put all things under his feet and made him to be the head over all things to this new humanity, the church, the fullness of him who fills all things everywhere. So may the universe someday be filled full of the life of Jesus Christ. And while we're here in our stewardship, may we do our part to bring that to pass. And this we thank you for in his matchless name. Amen. 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 Galatians chapter 4, well-known prayer, which those of you who've listened to our tapes or have been in the meetings before have heard me mention many, many times because this is Paul's central prayer for the Galatians that he had led to Christ maybe 10 or possibly 14 years before this is written on his first missionary journey. And they had a great start. Now don't doubt that he's talking to Christians because here in the fourth chapter he says, now that you've known God. And he says in the third chapter, you began in the Spirit. And so these are born-again believers, but they're off the track. So it says in the fifth chapter, and verse 7, you were running well, and they had a good start. How good a start did they have? Well, you can read Acts 13 and 14, where it tells how these Galatians came to Christ, and it says that the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost, and the next chapter says the word of the Lord was published throughout all that region. And so these were spontaneous, enthusiastic Christians. And 14, 10 years later, he has to pray this for them. Verse 19, Oh, my dear children, and I'm using William's translation tonight again. Oh, my dear children, I am suffering a mother's birth pangs for you again. Now, he did this the first time when he brought the good news to them 10 years earlier. But now, 14 years later, he's in birth pangs again, like a mother. And why is he in birth pangs again? Until Christ is formed in you. Now this is the bullseye of the Christian message. This is the, as we would say, raison d'etre, the reason for the existence of the church of Jesus Christ. That Christ might be formed not in a building, not in a beautiful painting like this one here, the sketch that's to my left, which Nancy called my attention to, of Jesus laughing over here on the left. That's a great portrait and an artist concept of what Jesus looked like. I really like that a lot. But that's not Christ formed, not in the Bible, not in a creed. It's God's purpose. It was Paul's purpose, and he was never satisfied. In fact, he says in this fourth chapter to these Christians, and he had a good many of them, because it says a great number turned to the Lord in Acts 13 and 14. And he established at least four churches in Pisidian, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, which was no mean feat. 
And in spite of that, he says, I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed on you labor in vain, because they had not realized the chief purpose, the bullseye, the raison d'etre of Christianity is that Christ might be formed in every single Christian. Now that's a mystical experience. God wants that to happen. Don't forget these people were born again. But that's all they were. They were saved by the skin of their teeth. And now they were returning to their former ways, religious ways. And he says, you're observing days and months and times and years. And I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed on you labor for nothing. Now he wanted Christ to be formed in them. How can Christ be formed in you? How can Christ be formed in me and in our brothers and sisters across the country? And I want to tell you something, if you're not aware of it tonight, and it's true, that unfortunately for the past 2,000 years, now you see Paul was praying this 2,000 years ago for primitive Christianity in its early days, when they didn't have the book that I have before me tonight. It took three centuries to put this book together that we call the New Testament. They didn't have this book. The only book they had was the Old Testament. And many things that they were being told by the Spirit were in contradiction to what they had in the Old Testament. As, for example, don't circumcise your children. And so this was a new order and new things were happening here. And so he's praying that Christ might be formed in them. And here are these Christians in the early days of Christianity and then 2,000 years go on. And thank God there have been some people who have had Christ formed in them. And we look back through church history and we refer to them as saints or mystics or prophets. And we could stand here tonight and name some of them like St. Teresa and Juliana of Norwich and many, many others like, uh, for example, uh, Brother Lawrence, you know, the practice of the presence of God, Terstegan and people like that. And they stood out as great mountaintops in what we call the Dark Ages over a thousand years when people were locked up in an institution, and thank God many of them found Christ, no doubt, as Savior, but Christ wasn't formed in them. And what was said by Carl Jung and by a Catholic theologian is certainly true that many times the church became a place where people hid out so that they wouldn't have to have a head-on, first-hand encounter with a living God, and that's the truth. Many times the church became a protective device to keep people from having a first-hand experience with the living God. They reduced everything to doctrine. They reduced everything to code. They reduced everything to creed. They reduced everything to ritual and liturgy. And they'd go through the motions, but they did not know how to personally interact, dialogue, and have intercourse with the living God. Now, you know that that's true for century after century after century. Now the day has come when God is touching many, many lives. How can Christ be formed in you? This is a day of tremendous spiritual hunger. And there are people all over the world, and many of them you couldn't drag to any church with a team of horses because they've had a belly full of religion. But they are interested in finding living Christianity, and they are interested in finding the living God. Some of them are badly. There's some kooky people out there that search all over the place trying to find God, and thank God they do, but they may err badly in their expression of how they want to find God. How can Christ be formed in us? Turn back, please, to Luke chapter 1 and the beginnings of the Christmas story in Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> now you know that Gabriel appears to Mary. And uh, he says, you're going to be highly favored of God. You'll become pregnant, verse 31 and bear a son, and you must name him Jesus. Verse 32, Luke 1, He will be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his forefather David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His reign will have no end. What a great announcement to a humble Jewish maiden. And notice what Mary asked. Now, What's happening here is that the angel Gabriel comes with a message to Mary, a humble Jewish maiden, and says, God wants, this is the first time this message appears. Very important, the law of first mention in the Bible. God wants Christ, he wants Jesus, to be formed in you, a Jewish maiden. And she asked a very 
pertinent question in verse 34 because she's thinking naturally, like we always do. And you'll remember that in Romans 8, the natural mind is at enmity with God. It isn't subject to the law of God and never can be. And as long as you and I think rationalistically, as long as we think in three dimensions, in two plus two equals four type of logic, then we're never going to hear from God in the way He wants us to hear from Him because God always speaks mysteriously and miraculously to us in symbols. And He speaks to us in pictures, in allegories, in images, in metaphors. And notice she says, thinking naturally, when the angel tells her, God wants Christ to be formed in you. This is the first time this is to happen. And she asks a very natural question, which we would ask too. How can this be since I have no husband? Now she's thinking naturally on this. She's thinking about what natural power can do. And you know the Bible is full of this. For example, when God told Abraham, someday you'll have your own heir. And of course he prayed that his steward, Eliezer, whom he liked a lot and loved a lot, he prayed that he might be his heir, and God said, no, he's a good steward and he'll be blessed, but he's not your heir. I'll give you somebody from your own body to be your heir. And then, of course, he uh, took things into his own hands with Sarah's connivance and produced Ishmael through Hagar, and then he prayed, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. And he was thinking naturally. Why did he do that? Because as Sarah said to him, you're getting too old and so am I, and we haven't had a son until now, and we don't want God to be embarrassed, we'll help him out. And so they brought in Hagar, and Ishmael came. And God said, no, Ishmael will become a great nation, but he's not the one I'm talking about. I'll give you an heir. And so when all hope is naturally gone, you see how we like to think naturally. And it's the same with a Christian. We think, how can I please God? By trying harder, like Avis Renicar, right? We're number two, we're going to try harder. And the harder you try, the more you flop. Did you ever notice that? And the more you try to be nice, the more you try to be good, the worse you get. Did you ever notice that? Have you gone that far in your Christian life? And many people think that is the Christian life, to run around like a roadrunner. You don't have roadrunners here in the East, but we do in the West, but you've seen them in cartoons, haven't you? And they run around with their neck out, and their legs look like wheels they're running so fast. And that's the way many Christians are. They're running around trying to be nice, trying to be good, trying to be holy, and having a bad time of it. Now, that's what Abraham was doing, trying to do this thing naturally. And so when all hope was gone, God came with two angels to the tent one day, and he said, next year, now Abraham's a hundred years old and Sarah's ninety, or nearly so, when the angels come with God and say in the tent uh, so that she can overhear them while she's preparing dinner, about this time next year Sarah will conceive and have a son. And uh, Sarah thought that was mighty, mighty funny. And she said, I'm 90 and Abraham's 100 and we haven't had any son all these years and we've waited 35 years and this is crazy. And she laughed. And you know, uh, that's a very natural reaction. And uh, once God told Abraham before this, by the way, you're going to have a son, and he fell on his face and he laughed. And so they both laughed about this. And they, You know, uh, it's a cynical laugh. Finally, you say, you've been bringing up that old chestnut all these years and we still don't have our son, forget it, and they fell on their face and laughed. Well, Sarah laughed in the tent, and God says, why did she laugh? I don't know whether he didn't have a sense of humor or what, but he said, why did she laugh? And uh, then she lied, like we usually do when we get caught with our hand in the cookie jar, and she said, I didn't laugh, and he said, no, but you did, and he said, this, now hear this, is anything too hard for the Lord? See, this is a supernatural thing. We try to make the Christian life, although we wouldn't admit it, a natural thing by trying to be like Jesus. We get a picture like that on the wall, and then we project into the picture what we think Jesus was like, and then we try to be like it. That's the wrong way. That's putting the cart before the horse. And few of us have ever seen a cart dragging a horse down the street. And that's what we usually do. And so we have to get to the end of our rope, and that takes lots of trying and lots of flopping and lots of failing and lots of falling on our face like Abraham and Sarah, and they tried everything under the sun and nothing worked, and so they laughed. And God said, is anything too hard for the Lord? You know what? When you're at the end of your rope, something that God told you maybe for years that you couldn't hear, all of a sudden comes alive in your spirit. Is anything too hard for the Lord? And all of a sudden it dawned on Abraham, and I'm not going to quote the verses tonight from Romans 4 and Hebrews 11, but it came alive in both of them 
Wait a minute, God never said we had to do this thing in the first place. This is something that He's got to do, and it's His problem. How about that? And so they began to say, is anything too hard for the Lord? And a year later, Isaac was born, and what a great name to give the child, which means, you know, laughter. Isaac means laughter. And so they named their kid Laughter, and it was a good idea to do that, wasn't it? <coughs> when we get to the end of our rope, so uh, Mary here in verse 34 has a natural question. How can this be? I have no husband. Verse 35, then the angel answered her. Now we're trying to seek out how God's going to do this thing to you and me. Then the angel answered her and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now, overshadow. Uh, this is an interesting thing. <clears throat> you know, God put clouds on people time and time again. You know that, don't you? The bright cloud of His glory. He brought that down on people time and again, didn't He? For example, it was a bright cloud that led Israel out of Egypt. And then Moses entered into a cloud when he got the law, didn't he? And then when the tabernacle was set up, a cloud filled the house. And when the temple of Solomon was set up much later on, the temple of God so filled the house that the priest couldn't stand to minister before the Lord, right? And so the angel's saying, this cloud will come upon you, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. That's where the word cloud comes from. It's a... Uh, Piskiazo in the uh, Greek, and it means that this cloud will overshadow you, and so your child will be called holy, the Son of God. By God's power, this child will be born in you. That was the first time God ever did this for a human being. Christ w first came to earth through a humble Jewish maiden, and he was formed in her womb by the power of God when the cloud of God came upon her and overshadowed her. Then Christ was formed within her, and was born through her, and the world was blessed. And when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. Now come back to Luke chapter 9, please. This is a little different incident here. And Jesus is teaching, and in Luke 9 and verse 23, and we continue to seek the answer to this, how can Christ be formed in us? Here was Christ formed in Mary, in a Jewish body. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So that when Jesus was walking here and He entered 30 years after that incident that we just read in Luke 1, after the Christmas story, into His public ministry, then He could say to His disciples, when they said, show us what God is like and we'll be satisfied, he says, he that hath seen me hath seen what God is like. Amen. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So anybody could look at that Jew 2,000 years ago and say, if they had eyes to see, and that's a big if, if they had eyes to see, this is the Son of God like the soldier who stood at the foot of the cross after Jesus died and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. See, he had eyes to see. The two on the way to Emmaus who were depressed beyond measure and in a blue funk because all their plans had come crashing down and they were going out to Emmaus from Jerusalem and they were totally sad because their God had died. And you know, many of us have to go through a time when our old God dies in order to find the new one. Now think about that. And there God had died. And a stranger joins them in the road and says, Why are you so long-faced and uh, sad of countenance? And it disgusted them, made them a little angry. They said, Are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Don't you know what happened? Jesus of Nazareth, a, might, a man mighty in word and deed. And please notice that when Jesus appeared in his new form, they did not recognize him. And don't forget that, neither will you when he appears to you in a new way for a little while until you get used to it. Don't forget that. They didn't recognize him. They said, three days ago he died. And then we've had disturbing reports that the tomb is empty, somebody's stolen his body or whatever, and uh, we don't know what to think. And then he said to them, this stranger, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered and to enter into his glory? You know, you can read the Bible 500 times. And still there'll be things in it you'll never see until you're ready to see them, because we never see anything until we're ready to see it. 
and they didn't notice the sufferings of Christ. They thought Christ would deliver them from the Roman kingdom and set Israel up as the head of the nations and all their plans and aspirations. God had bitterly disappointed them and had up and died on them. And that's a fact. And so he explains to them and expounds to them from Moses and the prophets all the things concerning himself. They invite him in. I think it's one of the most dramatic, beautiful scenes in the Bible. And while he's breaking bread. Have you ever met, met Christ like that? It always moves me to tears to think about it. Here they were in total depression. Unless you've been through this, it wouldn't move you. I've been through it thousands of times in my life. When I thought God was dead and everything else. Have you ever been in a time like that? And all of a sudden, in the breaking of the bread. Just some little thing that God does, and all of a sudden the whole thing's turned upside down. And you recognize Him in the breaking of the bread. You know what I'm talking about tonight? That's the living God. You know what they did? They got up out of their chairs because He vanished out of their sight. And they fled the eight miles back up to Jerusalem. It was a long walk coming out, but it was a short walk going back. And they burst into the upper room, and they said, The Lord is risen indeed. How about that? And I'll tell you, they were full of vim, vigor, and vitality, these people who'd been depressed. And those characters in the upper room said, We, we know it. <laughs> it's disgusting not to be the first person to bring the news, isn't it? <clears throat> Especially after you've been through all of that. Now, notice uh, this incident here. Jesus is teaching. And he says in verse 23, Luke 9, If anyone chooses to be my disciple... Now, what's a disciple? A disciple is one, according to Jesus' definition, who's like his Lord. It does not mean that we hang a beautiful picture like that on the wall and try to be like it. It means that we live the way he lived, and he tells us how to live. If you want to be like me, you must say no to self. Put the cross on your shoulders daily. That means be willing to go through many deaths and many, many changes. A Christian ought to be changing all the blessed time. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passing away. All things are becoming new. And so change is a part of our Christian life. Shame on these cemetery keepers who always want to keep everything the same. Morticians. He must say, no to self, put the cross on his shoulders daily and continue, continue to follow me. Whoever chooses to save his lower life, not talking about losing your salvation here at all. He's talking about hanging on to what you've got and being rigid and hard and brittle and refusing to change. If you want to hang on to your lower life, you'll lose your higher life. You know, the acorn that refuses to fall into the ground and die never becomes an oak tree, and that's what he's talking about here. The little uh, seed of corn that refuses to go down into the ground never becomes a corn stalk and brings forth a hundredfold either. So he says, if you want to hang on to your lower life, you lose your higher life. But if you've got the right attitude, which uh, I'm willing, and listen, that's all God asks of us, is willingness, not willpower, not trying hard. He asks us to be willing. And if you're willing, He'll do the work. He'll work in you to will and to do His good pleasure, Philippians chapter 2 tells us. And if you're willing, here's the thing. Whoever gives up his lower life for my sake will save his higher life. Now, I could read the rest of this, but come down to verse 27. I solemnly say to you, some of you who stand here... Now, notice that he is uh, connecting the teaching to what follows here. Some of you who stand here will certainly live to see the kingdom of God. Now, we're living in the days of the kingdom of God. We pray thy kingdom come. Well... That's for the whole world. But the kingdom already has come. Luke 17, 20. The kingdom of God is where? Within you. All right, now here's what, what is uh, told to us about this business then. Now, about eight days after this, he said to his disciples who were listening to this teaching about losing your lower life, being willing to change, give up your brittle rigidity, and let God break up your present life in order that you might grow and become something new and bigger and better. Now, he says, there's some of you standing here that will certainly live to see the kingdom of God. Now, last Sunday morning, the Spirit of God led me to teach on something I haven't taught on in a long time, namely the concentric circles of discipleship. Dr. Roy L. Brown had a great chart in the old days. And he used to uh, have a bunch of circles on one of those charts. And the outer ring of those circles, 500 
disciples who witnessed the resurrection. Remember that? And then there's another circle inside of that one, 120, who were in the upper room. And then there's another circle inside of those two, 70, who went out house to house visitation and so on, on a mission Jesus sent them two by two. Remember that? And then inside of that, there's another circle of 12 disciples who are closer to Jesus. Each one of these circles get closer to the living Christ. And then inside of those twelve, there were three, right? Peter, James, and John, who experienced some things that Philip, Andrew, Thomas, and Bartholomew did not experience, even though they were in the twelve. And here it is. And what makes the difference? The difference is, for example, in John's case, that disciple whom Jesus loved. Why? Because he leaned on Jesus' bosom. These men had paid the price to come from that circle of 500, so to speak, right down to the heart of God. They'd been willing, willing, willing to have the will of God in their life. They'd been willing to have God break up their present mode of being in order to know God better. That's what it takes. Presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. Being willing to die daily, see? Being willing to let God break up our present mode of being so that we can become something bigger and better and a better expression of what Jesus Christ is. And so he said, some of you are here, after you've done this excellent teaching, who won't die, you'll live to see the kingdom of God. Now notice verse 28. About eight days after this, Jesus said this. Uh, about eight days after Jesus had said this, he took Peter, James, and John and went up on the mountain. And he went up there to pray, and while he was praying, the look on his face changed. Please notice that again. Here's a new Christ. Here's a different look. Here's a different face. Every time God takes us to a higher level of discipleship and spirituality and development, God looks different to us, and please don't ever forget it, because it always startles and surprises us to see God looking different than we've been accustomed to see Him looking. And so his face changed. Now, the Spirit of God didn't put that in the Bible for nothing. And he wants you to understand that when you are selected like these three out of the ring, the inner circle ring of twelve and taken up into a mountain, into a high place, which we call the Mount of Transfiguration, that his face changed. And you will have a God with a new face as you grow and develop and achieve higher spirituality. Now, his clothes turned dazzling white. Verse 30, two men were talking with him. They were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in splendor, and they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now, the interesting thing is that Peter, James, and John had never seen Moses and Elijah, and they recognized them instantly. That ought to tell us something, too. And so, verse 32. Now, Peter and his companions had been overcome by sleep. What sleep? Unconsciousness. So many of God's people are sound asleep. They go to church many times. Maybe they're there every time the doors open. But when they come in, they can sit there with the same expression on their face, and they have eyes and see not and ears and hear not. That's why we have so many Christians that don't change at all. So many churches that don't change at all. We've got millions of them, and they're asleep like Peter, James, and John. Now, they had been asleep, unconscious. And it says in Ephesians 5.14, to the best church in the New Testament, the Ephesian church, it says, Awake, thou that sleepest, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. L-I-G-H-T. Yes. And it's up to you and me to awake when we're asleep and let Christ give us light. Now, how do we do that? We simply say to God, I want to be awake, I want to be alert, I want to be conscious, and you start paying attention to things that have to do with spiritual consciousness. You start developing your spiritual senses. If you wanted to learn how to paint, then you'd certainly go and take a few rudimentary lessons. I loved oil paint, and I took some in Florida, and I find it very relaxing and very peaceful to get out the brushes, which I haven't been able to do in the last two years, and when I get home and the snow starts flying, I'm looking forward to doing some oil painting. Now you have to get a few lessons, and you get alert, and you know the more you paint, the better you paint. Did you know that if you've got the gift? Now it's like paying, playing a piano. If you don't have the gift of painting, and you don't have the gift of playing the piano, then don't keep it up. 
Don't make other people miserable, you know? I told my wife the other night that I wish that my brother and I could give a piano concert. We'd be like Franny and Teicher. And she laughed her head off because both of us took three years of piano lessons and can hardly play a note because we don't have the gift. But our mother, who was an excellent pianist, tried to make us in her image and made us take lessons, and so we took them, and we used to drive some other people in our house nuts practicing. And believe me, if we could have escaped, we would have, but we couldn't. And finally, when we got old enough, we told her we'd like to cease practicing the piano. We had no gift. Now, you do have a gift. You do have a talent to know the living God. You may only have one talent. You may have two. You may have five. If you have five, God expects you to multiply them. If you have two, God expects you to multiply them. And if you only have one, God expects you to multiply it. He expects you to wake up and use what you've got, even if it's only one talent, to the glory of God. There was a man up in Vermont years ago in Burlington at the University of Vermont. That's one of my favorite places. My older son graduated from there and from medical school there. And this man was definitely a one-talent member of the body of Christ who was in the church in the Burlington area. His name was Donnie. He was just slightly mentally retarded. But you know what he did? He went to the laboratory every day in that uh, scientific section of that great university. And he washed beakers and scientific glasses and instruments and dishes and things like that. But you know this fellow who was just <clears throat> even slightly retarded. He did everything he did because he loved the Lord. He only had one talent. But he really loved God, and his face was shiny. And he'd go in there, and you know there were a lot of atheists in the university. You know that. Could I have some of this water, brother? Thank you. Go ahead and uh, pour, if you will, and I'll keep talking. We don't want this to get dry. <clears throat> and he'd do everything he did to the glory of God, and his face was shiny. And you know, that man would wash those dishes the very best he could, and he'd do it for Jesus, because he really loved him. And Jesus was in him, and he knew he was in him. And you know, they wrote him up in the university paper and put his testimony word for word in that paper, so that all the atheists and the agnostics and everybody else who didn't have hope in Christ could read what a man who did have hope in Christ, what joy he had found in his own life, even though he was one talent member, he knew how to multiply it into two. That's what God expects. Thank you, brother. With each one of us. Now look further here. His face changed. There were Moses and Elijah, and Peter and his companions overcome by sleep. But, verse 32, all at once they were wide awake, and they saw his splendor. You know, you ask God to open your eyes, you can see his splendor. If you pray, Lord, show me your glory, he'll show you his glory. All at once they were wide awake and they saw his splendor and two men standing with him. And as those two men were starting to leave him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us put up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Now, why would Peter say a thing like that? Well, it said he did not know what he was saying here in this, this passage of Scripture. But you know, Mo, uh, Moses and Elijah were great giants of spirituality in the Jewish economy. And Peter was highly honored, along with uh, James and John, to be in such company. And he was overwhelmed by it. And he thought, here are three great men of God. Here's Moses and Elijah and Jesus. And so he says, let's make three tents. Now notice what happens. He didn't know what he was saying, but verse 34 as he was saying this, a cloud. Hey, there's that cloud again. There's the cloud again. When Mary said, how can, I, how can this happen to me? I don't have a husband. The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overcloud you, overshadow you. As he was saying this, a cloud came and was circling over them, and they were frightened as the two visitors, Moses and Elijah, entered into the cloud. Now please notice what follows. Verse 35, Then a voice, and don't be surprised when God manifests himself in a new way if you have the same experience that Peter, James, and John, who were closest to the heart of Jesus, had. 
They were frightened. Sometimes when new things happen in our life, we're fearful because we don't understand what's happening. That's just part of being human. Don't worry about it. It's part of spiritual growth. Once in a while they get scared when God does something new. All right, notice the next thing here, verse 35. Then a voice came out of the cloud and said, This is my Son, my Chosen One. Continue to listen to Him. And when the voice had ceased, Jesus was found to be alone. Moses and Elijah disappeared. Now remember how the Jews revered Moses, the lawgiver, and Elijah, that great prophet? But God purposely said, here was a great lesson when God's doing a new thing on the mountaintop to a select few because Jesus was an elitist. He did not deal basically with the masses. He did not have any illusions about the masses ushering in great reform. He dealt with people who had a spiritual capacity in concentric circles. The closer they got to Him, the more He showed them. And I hope that tells us something. And if you've got a heart for God and you get close like Peter, James, and John, He'll show you some things like He showed Peter, James, and John. And you'll have the same kind of experience. But Peter and James and John were devout, kosher Jews who were trained in their religious tradition and they esteemed and revered Moses and Elijah. And it was very interesting that Peter wanted to make three tents and preserve Moses and Elijah, but a voice comes out of the cloud and points a finger at one person and says, This is my son. Listen and continue, please notice, Continue listening to him, and Moses and Elijah disappear. Now, I hope you learned something about spiritual growth from this tonight. Turn back, please, to Galatians chapter 4, if you're following along in your Bible. And that is that when God causes us to grow, things that had once blessed us spiritually and religiously, like Moses and Elijah, Things that were once foundational to our spiritual lives and to our very identity, because as kosher Jews, they were like, perhaps you saw that movie years ago, which was such a magnificent movie, Fiddler on the Roof. And Tevye sang a song called Tradition. Remember that? I know who I am. I know who I'm supposed to be. I know what I'm supposed to do by tradition. And that's the kind of Jew that Peter, James, and John were, but they loved Jesus. And so they were taken up into a high place of new revelation. And as you grow up and you have a capacity for God, I don't care who you are, things that were once foundational to your spirituality are taken from you. They disappear, just like Moses and Elijah. And don't be surprised when it happens. Now, does that sink in tonight? There comes a time when a Christian who has been a great Bible reader, and I used to read my Bible through three times a year, and believe me, most Christians need to read and study and get saturated in their Bibles. I memorized everything from Romans to the end of the New Testament. And so I got saturated in the Bible. That's what I was supposed to do. And I used to read it through, as I say, three times a year. But there came a time when God astounded me and said, I don't want you to read it anymore now because it's part of you. And it was part of me. He said, I want you to look at this book by this scientist. I want you to look at this book by that psychologist. I want you to look at this book by this atheist. By an atheist? Yes. Because God can speak through anything, anywhere, anytime. And the Bible says, all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death, all things are yours. You're Christ and Christ belongs to God. How about that? God can use anything. You say, how will I know it's from God? By trial and error. How else did you learn to walk? How did you learn to swim? How did you learn to do anything? Because you were willing to make some mistakes and try the spirits and find out what was from God and what wasn't from God. We don't need to run scared on this. Do you think God's big enough to hold us up? It was God who was pushing them out of their old nest. And they didn't realize it, see? So Moses and Elijah disappeared. Now, a voice came out of the cloud, and imagine these fishermen being up there and seeing the cloud that their forefathers had seen when they came out of Egypt. Imagine that. 
This was the cloud that covered Mary. This was the cloud that covered the temple of Solomon, that covered the tabernacle in the Old Testament. This was the shine of glory of God. And a voice spoke to these three men with Jesus on the mountaintop and said, This is my Son. Continue to listen. Hear that? Continue to listen to Him. So the question is tonight, as Paul prays in Galatians chapter 4, where we began this study, My little children, of whom I am in birth pangs again, till Christ be formed in you. Now supposing here in Peekskill and environs, you had people like we have here tonight, there are people here tonight that love the Lord. But supposing you had people who had one talent capacity, people who had two talents, and people who had five, and we have that, don't we? And God gives those capacities. And He expects us to multiply them. Now supposing that you had people who could go out here in their body of flesh and increasingly let Christ live through them. And I don't mean try to be like Jesus. I do not mean trying to be like Jesus. I don't mean trying to be nice and trying to be good. That's absolutely detrimental to New Testament Christianity. Charles Trumbull said the worst heresy in the Christian church is the heresy of Christians trying to live the Christian life. Amen. Would to God that someday we get that message. It's taken 2,000 years and very few Christians, relatively speaking, have ever gotten that message. That the greatest heresy in the Christian life is the heresy of Christians trying to live the Christian life. Say, that doesn't sound biblical to me. Well, then flip a page and come back to the third chapter in verse 3. Paul's talking to these Christians. And he says, are you so senseless? Did you begin in the Spirit, but you're now approaching perfection by fleshly means? What does that mean? Are you living the Christian life with a do-it-yourself kit? That's what it means means, well, I want to make Jesus look attractive in the streets of Peekskill. How do you do that? By trying to be nice. Baloney. Did Jesus look nice to his contemporaries? No. You know who he looked particularly odious to? You know who had lots of objections about Jesus? Not Roman soldiers. Not Roman soldiers. They didn't take notice of him probably until certainly the days of his public ministry. And then when he died... Who, who was it that had most of the objection? The bar, bartender's union. He was always on... Was it the bartender's union? No. They didn't have objection. We don't read anything in the, in the Scriptures about the bartender's union not liking Jesus. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, we read that the <clears throat> sinners loved Him. Is that right? Yeah. And that was one of the charges that a certain class of people brought against Him. This man eats with sinners. This man can't be from God because he has his inner, inner circle of friends notorious sinners, like this clown Zacchaeus the tax gatherer, right? They used to object about things like that, didn't they? Yeah. Now, who, uh, in the eyes of people who were absolutely pure, at least in their own eyes, who were the biblicists, the Bible students, the Pharisees, they were the guys who wore Scripture verses around their neck who broadened the hem of their garment, who liked to stand on the street corner and pray so people would know that there was a holy man, who loved the chief places at the banquets and liked to be called doctor. Those were the guys who said, this man can't possibly be from God. He doesn't keep the rules. How about that? Is that what the Bible says? He's a Sabbath breaker, right? He went out of his way continuously to do things on the wrong day on the Sabbath. Is that what the Bible says? So he looked like a rule breaker in the eyes of his contemporaries, didn't he? Get over this business of Jesus looking nice and being good. They said, this man can't be from God. Furthermore, there's a company of women that travel with him. Did you ever notice that? Yeah. Highly suspect. <laughs> now, he didn't look so good. No, no, God's not talking about that. Supposing a whole bunch of people here, even a handful of them, here in, in Peekskill, could increasingly get in touch with God's very life. Not their life trying to be like God, but God's life actually flowing through them. That's what God had in mind, isn't it? Out of your inner being will flow rivers of living water. How does that happen? John 7, If any man's thirsty, let him come unto me and drink. 
and out of his inner being will flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit. And he said to the woman at the well, Look, if you'd ask me water, you never thirst again. And she misunderstood, and she was thinking naturally like Mary and like Abraham and Sarah. Why, I don't want to have to bring my pot to this. So give me that water. He said, oh, the water that I'll give you will be in the Bible. Did he say that? He didn't say anything of the kind. He said, the water that I'll give you will be in the church. No, he didn't. He said, the water that I'll give you will be in you a well springing up, didn't he? In where? In you. In you. Supposing you could get God's life in you. One talent members, two talent members, five talent members started living, letting God's water flow out, whether they had a little well or a big one. And God was flowing through those people. Now you know what people like that look like. They get on the street and pounce on everybody that comes along, try to evangelize them, right? They say, brother, if you don't get saved, you're going to hell. And they start, right, that makes everybody happy. <laughs> they always love to hear that message in that fashion, you know, and especially from that type of person. That's why they start jumping up and down for joy and can hardly wait to get to church and give their testimony. You know that's baloney. <clears throat> but supposing they find somebody out there who knows how to love. And who's got some joy and some peace. And above everything else, who's real? How about that? Instead of being phony. You know what Jesus said to those religious nuts who were always criticizing Him? Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, hupokrites, wearers of the mask. That's what hypocrite means. They were wearing the mask. They were pretending to be something they weren't. The world is looking for something real. This is a phony world, and the world is looking for something real. They're hungry for real people. And uh, along about the fourth verse, I quoted this already, but look at it. The question is, how can Jesus be formed in you? Now, you remember we started off with this prayer, My little children of whom I am in birth pangs again, till Christ be formed in you. Wouldn't it be nice to have some people in Peekskill and in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, so that people would look at that person and see something different and attractive and magnetic about them, and come to them and say, what have you got? You know, that happens to Christians who are full of God's life. And hungry people could find somebody real. How could Christ be formed in you so that that Christian out there could say, he that hath seen me hath seen what Jesus is like. How about that? And it doesn't mean that you're a carbon copy of the person seated next to you tonight, that there's one copy up here of Jesus, and then all of us have to look like that. Now, that's a beautiful sketch there. But we don't all want to look like that, do we? They'll put us in an institution if all of us look like that. <laughs> you know it, don't you? But that's what we Christians try to do. Oh, I, and listen, you want, want to keep laughing, because when people start getting distracted, when you stand up in the pulpit and people start getting disturbed, you know that you're hitting their brownie points. You know, there are a lot of people who have been going to church for years, and they have perfect attendance pins, and they've served on the board, and they've done this, and they've done that, and when you start preaching this kind of message that says your brownie points don't amount to anything, it disturbs them clear to their roots, because that's where their identity is. They work pretty. They say, now wait a minute, sporty, I work pretty hard to pile up those, bro those brownie points. And they don't like that. Well, that's what Jesus always did. He just ran rough shot. He said, you, John the Baptist used to really love to do him in on that. He said, you, you Jews, you think that because you're sons of Abraham and you've got centuries of experience as God's children and you have a long, rich heritage, he said, you think you're something special? I tell you, God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. And he knocked their brownie points upside down. Of course, he also lost his head. Remember that. You've got to know when to run. I'll tell you that. That's why I only come for one night to any town. <laughs> I'm not so dumb after all these years. 
It's how my wife keeps me young, running around fast. <laughs> now, supposing that you could appear out there and say, He that has seen me has seen what Jesus is like. Wouldn't that be great? That's what God had in mind. My little children, of whom I'm in birth pangs again, till Jesus be formed in you. He wants Christ to be formed in you. And it doesn't mean that you're perfect. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel, so that the excellency of the power is from God and not of us. See? I'm going to tell you a terrible title to a book. I was sitting with Peter Gilquist, who wrote a beautiful book called Love Is Now years ago, in a hotel in Atlantic City, and outside was Hal Lindsey through the glass. And Peter pointed him out, and he said, you ever met him? And I said, no. Now, Hal Lindsey had written that best-selling book, Late Great Planet Earth. And he said, Hal is going to write a new book because Hal had gone through a divorce and Christians had gotten on his back and everything else. And it's going to be titled, and this will, this will curl your feathers tonight, How to Be Holy Without Being So Damn Uptight. <laughs> now, that's not a bad title. Because there are so many Christians that look like they've been walking for the last 40 years with the same old corset on that's been too tight for them. And they're walking right up there on their tiptoes, and they look pretty ugly. And they have good reason to be, because they've been in pain trying to be good and trying to be nice all the while, instead of being real and being who God created them to be. Amen. Now, you know who God uses tonight? And if you can qualify in, on any of these five counts, God will use you. You know what God's chosen to use in this world so that you can say, He that has seen me has seen what Jesus is like? God has chosen the foolish, the weak, the base, the despised, and the things that amount to nothing. Now, do you qualify on any of those? Some of us qualify on all five, don't we? That makes you all the more useful. Why did God choose that? So that no flesh should glory in His presence. Hear that? That's 1 Corinthians 1. He's chosen the foolish, weak, base, despised, things that amount to nothing, so that no flesh can glory in His presence. You know, Abraham and Sarah tried to do it and couldn't do it. We used to kid my younger son, telling him that his epitaph would be, they said it couldn't be done, and he tried and couldn't do it. <laughs> and that's right. That's what Christians do. We try and we can't do it. But when we get to the end of our rope, God uses the foolish, the weak, the base, the despised, and the things that amount to nothing. Relax a bit and let God use you like you are. He uses sinners. There's only one kind of people available in this universe. Sinners. And then you can say when you're a sinner, he that looks at me has looked at Jesus. Say, is that really biblical? That's utterly biblical. The other stuff is anti-biblical. When you're taught to keep the rules and do the best you can, that's anti-biblical. Christ is the end of that kind of legalism. Romans 10.4. Now, Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 I quoted before, and it goes like this. When the proper time had come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born subject to law, to ransom those who were subject to law, so that we might be adopted as sons. Now remember what the cloud, the voice out of the cloud said on the Mount of Transfiguration to those three guys who had gone through the filtering process, and they were closest to the heart of God, Peter, James, and John, and they were with Him on the mountaintop. And the voice said to them, as Moses and Elijah disappeared, and the old stuff disappeared, this is my Son, keep on listening to Him. Well, where do I listen to them? Well, look at the next verse here in verse 6. And because you are sons, where is Jesus tonight? God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your heart. How about that? Where is Jesus tonight? God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, that is Father, so you're no longer a slave but a son. How about that? God's glory is in you tonight. The Son is in you tonight. It's the real you. You say, how can that be? It's the real you. You see, who we think is us is not the real me, the real you. That's why John the Baptist said, He must increase, I must decrease. Because God wants a whole race, a holy nation of little Christ. And you're it. And He's in you. The Son is in you. The fountain is within. God has sent the Spirit of His Son into your hearts. 
Not into the Bible, not into church, not into the creed, not into some televangelist, into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. Jesus is in you tonight, and God the Father out of the cloud says, keep on listening to what the Son is saying in your heart. How about that? That means you have to learn how to hear God speak in your heart, doesn't it? And so God says four times in Hebrews 3 and 4 to Christians, Today, if you want to hear my voice, harden not your heart. And when we take communion, we say, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. What's in that covenant? This is the covenant that I'll make. I'll put my law in your mind and write it in your heart. This is my son. Keep on listening to him. Where? As he speaks in your inner being. That's the real you. We'll close with this. Come back to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> now I want to ask you a personal question tonight. How did you get to be such a sinner? You said, well, I read this book. I read a book on sin. And I read that this guy Adam was a sinner. And I thought it would be nice to be like him. So I started to try to be like Adam. And I hung pictures of Adam on the wall and I tried to be like Adam. And I established an Adam class and I took my book and I went there and I read about Adam and I said, this is the way our father lived and this is the way we should live. And we all tried to be like Adam. And then you said, uh, you say, well, after I did that for a while, I realized that I wasn't a very effective sinner and I wanted to become more proficient. So I went to college to learn how to sin better. <laughs> Crazy, isn't it? And I'm really trying to imitate the chief sinner. He was worse than anybody, and that's, that's Adam. And he's, I've got his picture still hanging in my bedroom wall, and I'm trying to be like Adam. This is crazy, isn't it? You say, and I took an advanced degree. I finally got my doctorate in sin. <laughs> and so I'm a more effective sinner than you are. And so we boast of matters of degree. You say, you're insane. That's right, you are. We all know that, don't we? Because when we were born, we didn't have to go to school. We didn't have to hang a picture of Adam on the wall. We didn't have to write, read a book on how to sin. It came very naturally, didn't it? And so to be a sinner, all you have to do is do what comes naturally. All you have to do is just let the life that you receive flow out through you. And we're sinners, aren't we? Because of that. As an Adam all died. How did we get that way? Because we were born in Adam. How did we get that way? I didn't have anything to do with it, neither did you. God put us in Adam, didn't he? And so we got to be this way because Adam was that way. Now I want you to look at something here. You know, after we're sinners and then we get saved and we have a loss of our identity and we go through many identity crises... And we wonder who we are and how we're supposed to be like Jesus. Then we hang a picture of Jesus on the wall and try to be like Him, don't we? Then we read a book and try to find out how He lived, and we try to live something like that, only it's very, very bent out of shape. And we're not very successful at that. Here's a better way. Look at what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45. This is the way the Scripture puts it, too. The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, who's that? Jesus. Has become what? A life-giving spirit, it says here in Williams. A life-giving spirit. The last Adam has become a life... Jesus has become a life-giving spirit. Where does He live? This is my Son. Keep listening to Him. He lives in your heart. He's a life-giving spirit. He gives me life. He gives you life. He's the real you. Now listen, you were born in Adam, but you're not like anybody else in Adam, are you? Every one of us are unique, like fingerprints, like snowflakes. Even though we all have Adam's life, we manifest it a little bit differently, don't we? We don't sit down and think how we can do that. We don't try hard to do it. We just do it, don't we? Well, now look what happens here. Jesus, the last Adam, is a life-giving spirit. <clears throat> Verse 46, it is not the spiritual that comes first. It's the physical, we know that, 
Then comes the spiritual. What a genius Paul was. What great things he saw in Christ. Verse 47, the first man was made of the dust of the earth. The second man is from heaven. Now we're coming to some very heavy punch lines here. Those, verse 48, who are made of dust are just like him who was first made of dust. That's why I said you don't have to go to college and get an advanced degree to learn how to sin well. It comes naturally. Those who are made of dust are just like him who was first made of dust. Right? Now get this. Those who are heavenly are like him who is from heaven. You are somebody tonight. You are like Jesus Christ in the new life that's buried in your spirit. There's somebody in you tonight that you can trust. It's the real you. It's you born again in Jesus Christ. Mary said, how can this be, seeing I don't have a husband? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you and the thing that is born of you will be called the Son of God. And when the Holy Spirit came and brooded on you, Jesus said, you are born again, this time not of flesh. Didn't He say, you must be born again? Yes, sir. And this time, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit, if it tries hard enough, will be spirit. Didn't say that, did He? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. How about that? You've got a Spirit identity in you that's the real you. The old one must fade out as you grow in Christ, as you're willing to have Him work in you. The old one fades away, it dies away. Paul said, I died daily, didn't he? And the old one dies away as more and more you're able to strengthen and listen to the voice of the real person, the real you, the new creation as it takes control of your life. Christ is Lord of your life. I want to read that line again because it's so good. Those who are made of dust are just like him who was first made of dust, and those who are heavenly are like him who is from heaven. And as we've reflected the likeness of him who was made of dust, let us also reflect the likeness of the man from heaven. I told this story that I've told through the years, came to my mind the other day, that when I was a young man in ministry, I had a spiritual father, and his name was Dr. George Mundell. He was one of several spiritual fathers that I had in my fundamentalist days. There were some good fundamentalists who loved God with their whole heart. And this man was a rare bird among fundamentalists. He was a mystic. He was pastor of a large church in Derby, Philadelphia. And he was a noted conference speaker. He was in great demand. He was a smallish, thin man, austere. I suppose if he lived in the Middle Ages, he probably would have been in a monastery. He was that kind of a man. And he used to come to these conferences and speak. And when I first heard him speak, I just went and attended the conferences because I was a young man just in seminary and out of seminary. And uh, you might have two or three speakers at those conferences. They used to have great Bible conferences, and people would go and spend their vacation there for a week. You'd have sessions in the morning and in the evening, and different speakers at different sessions. And there were some good men there, and they brought good things, but when this man stood up to speak, they knew somebody special was standing there. And he used to start his sessions by singing a little chorus that he loved. Oh, to be like thee. O oh, to be like thee, precious Redeemer, Savior, and Friend. Come in thy sweetness, come in thy fullness, and then melt me into your image. And year after year when I'd hear him speak, and then as I grew older, I became a conference speaker. And I had the high privilege of standing on the same platform that my spiritual father did and speaking. And one year came when he astounded people. And usually when he came to a conference like Manahath in Altoona, Pennsylvania, the place was packed out. And always he'd start with that chorus, Oh, to be like thee, oh, to be like thee, precious Redeemer, Savior and Friend. And he stood up that year and shocked us all by saying, You know that I love to sing that chorus. We've sung it through the years. I never want to sing it again. 
and you could almost feel the people fall back. And he said, I'll tell you why I never want to sing it again. I, with everything in my heart, wanted to be like Jesus. And he said, this past year I found out I am like him. Don't let anybody put you down. You love God. You are somebody. You're Jesus in a new personality. You. God wasn't satisfied to have an only begotten son. He wanted millions of sons and daughters who were just like Jesus and had his life in them, but were unique in their own personalities. And you are somebody tonight. As my old friend Harold Hill once said, you're a king's kid. Let's read it again. Those who are made of dust are like him who was first made of dust. And those who are heavenly are like him who is from heaven. You are like him. Shall we bow together in prayer?